Um, the last time we looked at uh, this uh, diagonal dominant theorem, and we defined these uh, Gershkorin disks, which basically are circles centered at each of the diagonal entries and radius equal to the sum of the magnitudes of all the off diagonal terms in the same row. And uh, we saw that we, we saw this very, very interesting theorem, which was called the Gershkorin disk theorem which basically said that all the eigenvalues of A lie in the union of these n Gershkorn disks. Further, if a union of K of these n disks forms a connected region that is disjoint from the remaining n minus K disks, then there are exactly K eigenvalues in that connected region. Then we saw at the end of the last class, this theorem about the continuity of eigenvalues. So today we will see some consequences of this uh, Gershkorn disk theorem, and we'll also start talking about the condition number associated with eigenvalues. Remember that we've seen the condition number plays an important role in the sensitivity of solutions to linear systems of equations. We'll see similarly that there is a condition number related quantity that shows up when you're looking at sensitivity of the eigenvalue problem to perturbations in the matrix. Now, recall that the eigenvalues of A are in the union of these Gershkorn disks, which I'm going to denote by G of A. Similarly, since A and A transpose have the same eigenvalues, the eigenvalue of uh, eigenvalues of A lie in G of A transpose, which um, we can define uh, in this way, but basically it's the same definition of the Gershkorn disks, but defined with respect to A transpose. So it's the union J going from 1 to N, mod of Z minus AJJ less than or equal to the sum of all the off diagonal entries in the ith column of A. So because the eigenvalues must lie in this set as well as in this set, it must, they must all lie in the intersection of these two sets. Okay, so this can give us a tighter region within which we can locate the eigenvalues of A. And in particular, note that the largest modulus eigenvalue of A must also lie in this set. But then these are just circles, Z minus AJJ less than or equal to this. So we can actually find out the farthest point from the origin in this circle. Okay, the furthest point in DI from the origin, it has the modulus equal to, so the this, this circle, the di, the circle, is basically a circle that is centered at aii. So this is some complex number aii, and it has a radius equal to the sum of i uh, or j equal to one to n, J not equal to I mod AIJ. Okay, that's the radius. So if I look at the look for the furthest point, I have to go all the way up to AII and then I have to go up further this radius distance. So basically the furthest point has modulus AII plus summation J not equal to I mod of AIJ, which is just simply the summation J equal to 1 to N mod AIJ. Okay, so basically the largest mag modulus eigenvalue of A must be at most this much distance from the origin. So the largest modulus eigenvalue of A, but then of course the eigenvalues lie in the union of these Gershkorn disks. And so the largest um, eigenvalue mo in modulus of A is upper bounded by the largest row sum. It's also upper bounded by the largest column sum. And so from that, we get the following corollary that the spectral radius of A is less than or equal to the minimum of the largest column sum and the largest row sum. We've already seen this. Uh, we've seen it in this form. Actually, I should write it with three bars. Right, we've already seen this, but this is a more geometric view of the same result, that the spectral radius of A is less than or equal to the min of the largest row sum norm and the largest column sum norm. 
Okay, now another remark is that if S is an invertible matrix, then S inverse AS has the same eigenvalues as A. And so now we can apply Gershkorn disk theorem to S inverse AS and choose S. You know, the, we can we we can try to choose S cleverly to get sharper bounds. So here is an example. Suppose I have this matrix A equal to one one zero two. There are two Gershkorn disks. The Gershkorn disk, the first Gershkorn disk is centered at one and it has a radius equal to one. The second Gershkorn disk is centered at two and has a radius equal to zero. So the first disk is shown in red here. It is centered at one and it has a radius one. And the second disk is shown in black here. It is centered at two and it has a radius of zero. So the eigenvalues of A, in fact, for this we can read off the eigenvalues. They are one and two. And of course they lie in the union of these Gershkorn disks. Now suppose we use S equal to this diagonal matrix with P1 and P2 on the diagonal and P1, P2 being positive numbers. Then if I work out what S inverse AS is, it's P1 inverse, P2 inverse times this A matrix times P1, P2. And so if I solve this product, I get P1, P2, 0 and 2, P2. And then if I multiply that with this matrix P1 P1 inverse cancel and so the diagonal entry will remain 1 and the diagonal entry here will remain equal to 2 but the off diagonal term becomes P2 over P1. Okay and so now the first circle the second circle remains at center 2 and radius equal to 0 but the first Gershkorn disk will now have be centered at 1 and have a radius P2 over P1. Okay and P2 over and P1 P2 can be chosen such that P2 over P1 is positive but arbitrarily small and so you can actually locate the eigenvalues much more accurately you know that one is in the in some tiny neighborhood around one and the other eigenvalue is in a tiny neighborhood around two again of course the, in this case the matrix is upper triangular and so it's kind of trivial uh, you already know that the eigenvalues are one and two so you don't have to approximately locate them but for more complex matrices this could be a useful trick so let's generalize this so suppose S was a diagonal matrix containing P1 to Pn along the diagonal with all these Pi's being positive. Then if you look, work out the Ijth element of S inverse As, that's going to be equal to Pj times Aij divided by Pi. And now we apply Gershkorn theorem to this, this matrix S inverse As. If we do that, we get the following corollary. A is an n cross n matrix and P1 to Pn are some numbers which are positive, you know, greater than zero. Then the eigenvalues of A lie in. So the when you do this, the diagonal entries remain unchanged. So the centers of the circle remain unchanged. So it is mod Z minus AII is less than or equal to the sum of the off diagonal terms. When I'm summing over J, Pi does not depend on J. So I can bring it out of the summation. And so I have summation j not equal to i, pj times mod aij. And uh, this is basically g of s inverse as in my notation above. And also in union j equal to 1 to n, this is the column version, z minus ajj less than or equal to. When I am summing over, over i, this does not depend on i, so I can pull it out. I'll get pj times summation over i going from 1 to n, i not equal to j. 1 over pi times mod aij. So this can give us some more sharper bounds on the location of the eigenvalues. And specifically, I can think about optimizing pi and pj, uh, that is p1 to pn, such that these bounds are as tight as possible. Okay, so essentially all the eigenvalues lie in the intersection of all such choices, over all such choices of this p matrix. So it's in the intersection of D belonging to script D of the G, that is the union of Gershkorn disks corresponding to D inverse AD, where D, the script D, is a set of diagonal matrices with positive entries. So that's basically this corollary six, which is that the spectral radius, when applied, when this is applied to the spectral radius, we get that the spectral radius is at most the min over P1 to Pn being positive of the max uh, row sum norm or the max column sum norm, which is basically max over. This is the this is the sum across um, 
uh, across columns and this is the sum across rows. And then you are uh, free to minimize that over P1 to Pn and this minimum value of this is still an upper bound on row of A. It turns out that this upper bound is actually tight for any matrix with positive entries and there's a there's a proof in the text that you can look at. OK, now um, so far we've been discussing matrices that are arbitrary, not necessarily Hermitian. But suppose A was Hermitian, then the eigenvalues of A are real valued. And so then we can specialize the Gershkorn theorem to say that the eigenvalues belong to the real line intersection with the union of Gershkorn disks. So if I take these Gershkorn disks, which could be located wherever, OK, etc., and then I take the union of that with the real line. I just get these line segments. OK, so this is a finite union of intervals. You can similarly write, write out uh, tighter bounds when the matrix has additional structure like skew, Hermitian, unitary or orthogonal, etc. Now we also looked at a diagonal positive S to improve the inclusion regions of the eigenvalues. But uh, it's possible to get tighter bounds, perhaps, by considering more general S. But we won't look at that in this um, in this course. Now, one one related question is: Can you do better than the Gershkorn disk theorem, or is that the tightest uh, uncertainty region within which you can uh, you, you within which the eigenvalues of the matrix A are guaranteed to lie? The answer is no, because there is also, this is also there in the text, but it, it can be shown that if Z is some complex number on the boundary of G of A, okay, boundary of these Gershkorn disks, then you can find a matrix B, which matches A in the diagonal entries and matches A in magnitude in the off-diagonal entries, and such that this Z is an eigenvalue of B. OK, and so basically the point is that in Gershkorn's theorem, we are only using the main diagonal entries and the absolute values of the off diagonal entries. And that is indeed the tightest bound you can get on the uncertainty region within which eigenvalues lie. So if you want a tighter bound than the Gershkorn disk theorem, you will need to you will need to take into account the phase angles or the signs of the off diagonal terms. OK, now we move on to a different topic, which is the condition of eigenvalues. This was actually a topic that sort of initiated all this discussion, location and perturbation of eigenvalues. This whole chapter is about that. Now, um, I come back to this example we discussed in the first class we had on this chapter, where we looked at this matrix. And we said that these eigenvalues are very sensitive to small changes to this matrix. We added a 10 to the minus 2 here and we found that the eigenvalues became plus or minus 100 and plus or minus 100 i. So this is very sensitive to small changes in the eigenvalue. And in general, a matrix could have here there's only one eigenvalue 0 and this matrix is not a well conditioned matrix with respect to its eigenvalues in the sense that it is um, a small perturbation can lead to a large perturbation in eigenvalues. So by and large, this is the definition we will use for an eigenvalue being well conditioned or ill conditioned, namely that if you apply a small perturbation of size, size measured in some norm, if you if you apply a perturbation of size epsilon to the matrix A, then the perturbation in the eigenvalue should also be of the order epsilon. If that happens, we say that the matrix, uh, the eigenvalue lambda is a well conditioned eigenvalue. Otherwise, we say that it's an ill conditioned eigenvalue. So generally what happens is that these eigenvalues could be um, some of the eigenvalue. I mean, the matrix A could be well conditioned with respect to some of its eigenvalue values and ill conditioned with respect to the other eigenvalues. Now, in particular, if sir, the matrix, sir. yes. Sir, uh, suppose if I apply this epsilon perturbation uh, to diagonal entries, 
then um, it is not necessary for the eigen value to be ill conditioned right what i'm essentially trying to say is it also depends on where we apply the perturbation yes right yeah so so, yeah. so how yeah. can we conclude it is well conditioned in general so shouldn't it be a function of the position also yeah it depends yeah, on that so what we will be doing um, we will look at perturbations like this by a matrix e and what you are given is a matrix d plus e and an adversary is allowed to choose whichever entries in e they want to perturb and your eigen value should remain stable no matter which entries the adversary perturbs as long as the overall magnitude of perturbation is less than some epsilon okay that's the kind of guarantees that we will look for okay so i'll i'll, I'll explain that further as we go along so now in particular if you start with a matrix d which is diagonal and you let e be some perturbation matrix and consider d plus e now by gersh gorin theorem the eigen values of d plus e the the diagonal entries become lambda i plus eii so those become the new centers of these disks and the radius is the summation j not equal to i of eij right so that's basically your gersh gorin disk and the union of this over i going from 1 to n is where the eigen values are guaranteed to be located this is the, these are the eigen values of the perturbed matrix d plus e okay and now what i can do is to add uh, eii uh, and use triangle inequality and i can show that these eigen values uh, these these disks are actually contained in the this set of disks which is centered at lambda i and has radius mod eii plus this right hand side here which is summation j equal to 1 to n mod of eij okay so what that means is that if lambda hat is an eigen value of d plus e then it must hold that when i substitute lambda hat for z here that lambda hat minus lambda i less than or equal to this should hold for at least one of these i's and so that means there is at least there is some eigen value lambda i of of this matrix d such that lambda hat minus lambda i is less than or equal to the max of all these radius which is equal to the the l infinity norm of e okay so what this means then is that as long as i'm al allowed to only perturb the matrix a uh, d by a matrix e whose infinity norm is bounded then the perturbations in the eigen values are also bounded by the same quantity so in other words what this shows is that the eigen values of diagonal matrices are well conditioned unfortunately this argument does not extend to the non diagonal case but we can say more in two important special cases the first being when a is diagonalizable and the second being when lambda is a simple eigen value of a that is it's an eigen value whose algebraic multiplicity equals 1 we'll start with the second case so it's a simple eigen value and so we'll look at the condition of that specific eigen value so let lambda be a simple eigen value of a which means that it has algebraic multiplicity equal to 1 and let x be a right eigen vector and y be a left eigen vector corresponding to lambda and both being unit norm that means ax equals lambda x and y hamitian a equals lambda y hamitian and define s of lambda to be equal to the mod of y hamitian x okay the inner product between y and x the left eigen vector and the right eigen vector then we define the condition of the eigen value lambda to be 1 over s of lambda now because a lambda is a simple eigen value of a this s of lambda is unique and s of lambda is at most equal to 1 by the cauchy schwarz inequality and it's also is possible to show that s of lambda is not equal to 0 so it's a number between 0 strictly greater than 0 and less than or equal to 
Now let P be any matrix whose spectral norm equals one. Okay, that is um, square root of so spectral norm is square root of lambda, where lambda is the largest eigenvalue of P Hermitian P, or it's also equal to the max over all unit L2 norm vectors of the L2 norm of Px. So P um, P be a matrix such that it has spectral norm equal to one or spectral radius equal to one. Then um, define A of T to be A plus Tp. In other words, we are looking at perturbing the matrix A by a unit spectral norm uh, matrix multiplied by some coefficient t and think of t as being a small number. So if t is small enough, you're really applying a small perturbation on this matrix A. So I'm OK, so what am I doing here? I'm trying to show you why we consider one over s of lambda to be the condition of the eigenvalue lambda. In other words, when you perturb the matrix like this, A of t equals Tp, then the perturbation in the eigenvalue lambda will be of the order 1 over s of lambda times the perturbation that you apply, which is like t. Okay, that's what we, we will show. Now, suppose uh, lambda of t and x of t, both being differentiable in with respect to t in the neighborhood of 0, the eigenvectors and I, eigenvector and eigenvalue of a of t. OK, that is a of t times x of t equals lambda of t x of t. And note that when I set t equals 0, I get lambda of 0 and uh, that lambda of 0 equals lambda and x of 0 equals x where lambda and x are as I defined above. So x, lambda is a simple eigenvalue and x is its corresponding eigenvector. OK. And uh, define dash with to be to mean the derivative. So in other words, lambda dash of t is d lambda of t over dt, x dash of t is dx of t over dt, and a dash of t is da of t over dt. So we have the following proposition, which says that lambda dash of 0 in magnitude is at most 1 over s of lambda. What this means is that a small perturbation of order epsilon in a leads to a change in eigenvalue lambda of order at most epsilon over s of lambda. That is what lambda dash of zero being at most one over s, s of lambda means. OK, so how do you show this? So we start by differentiating this equation a of t x of t equals lambda of t x of t with respect to t. And then we set t equals zero. So if I differentiate this using the chain rule, I have a dash of t x of t plus a dash of so plus a of t x dash of t is equal to lambda dash of t x of t plus lambda of t x dash of t. So and then I'm substituted t equals zero to get this equation. But remember that a dash of zero, uh, a of t is equal to a plus t p. So a dash of zero is just p. And x of zero equals x, a of zero is just a. And here x of 0 equals x and lambda of 0 equals lambda. So substituting all that, I have px plus a x dash of 0 is equal to lambda dash of 0 times x plus lambda x dash of 0. And now we pre-multiply by y Hermitian. So I'll get y Hermitian px. And here I have y Hermitian a x dash of 0. But y Hermitian a is lambda y Hermitian. So I'll have a minus y Hermitian, so I'll have a minus lambda y Hermitian x dash of 0 on the right hand side. And uh, this is lambda dash of 0 times y Hermitian x, and this is lambda y Hermitian x dash of 0, which exactly cancels with the la lambda y Hermitian x dash of 0 coming from the left hand side. So these two cancel, and what I'm left with is lambda dash of 0 times mod y. So if I take the modulus of this equation, so just this equals, this is all I'm left with. So if I take the modulus on both sides, mod of lambda dash of 0 times mod y Hermitian x is equal to y Hermitian px magnitude, which by 
the sub multiplicativity of may uh, uh, and compact you use the idea of compatible norms and sub multiplicativity to write it as the product of the norm of y hermitian times the norm of p times the norm of x and we've started out by assuming that these both all three of these are equal to 1 and so we have lambda dash of 0 is less than or equal to 1 over y hermitian x which is 1 over s of lambda even if norm p2 is not equal to 1 we would just have a p2 is sitting in the numerator here so the re result looks more elegant if you use assume p2 equals 1 and write it as 1 over s of lambda okay so what this means is that if s of lambda which is mod of y hermitian x the inner product between the left eigen vector and the right eigen vector if that is close to 1 then the matrix is well the eigen value lambda is a well conditioned eigen value if it's close to 0 then it's an ill conditioned eigen value in this case it uh, it actually means that a is close to a matrix with lambda being a repeated eigen value so when you have repeated eigen values it's possible that you can apply small perturbations and make large changes in the eigen values not necessary but it's possible the result doesn't apply to that case